Welcome back to Dr. Bruce. Come with me now as we shall pass through the great void of non-being to bear witness to the coming to consciousness of the universe. I could, in this state, initiate some sort of a collapse in the universe. I could start it. Everything just started to pile in. Everything just sort of started to go in, and then I realized the stars were starting to come in. This, this thing was initiated. The whole thing just started to go in. And that weird thought, okay, someone pushed the button or gave permission to the universe to, to do what it's supposed to do, which is somehow come together in some way. You suddenly are open. You're open wide. You survive something about which you are most afraid. There's nothing got through that little razor's edge bridge. Nothing but just basic soul got through there. Everything else was blown to smithereens. Against that light, it was the core universe that was now starting to coalesce as a single being. Was I part of that? Was I in that? Who was in there with me? Was everything in there with me? Was I outside of it? What was going on? A question came to me is, all that had made it through that bridge was this tiny little bit of you that's called your soul. Not even a soul, but it's almost like a little wave, a little carrier tendril of existence. It's all that, that, is, that, that you exist. And so I asked this, as being part of this universe, I said, what does this little tendril need to be part of this? The voice came back, all it needs is love. This is almost like the ultimate trip you can ever go on, is contemplating the scope and scale of the universe. You can go to the playa and look at the Milky Way and suddenly you get a little peek of that. But I think the ultimate trip is to use the new tools of the knowledge of how old things are and how miraculous things are and how big things are. This is a, the time, a profound time in human history. Cosmologists are putting together a model of what, which may likely be the model of the formation of the universe. Now there's disputes about what model is really happening there, but what's happening is all these symmetries are being discovered. So for example, the symmetries that are so profoundly weird and simple that they make you rethink your life. For instance, the guy named Guth, uh, professor, I think he's at Harvard or MIT, and he has written an equation that people use shows that all gravity and all stuff like energy and matter, if you put it all up together, it has zero. So if you took the entire universe and were able to get it to come into contact, it would vanish. So you are made out of stuff that isn't stuff. You're, you're, the stuff you're made out of is not stuff. It has a complement somewhere that is completely cancels it out. Now that's kind of a weird thought. It's sort of like, well, why do we take things so seriously then? You know, it, so what is the universe? It's a bunch of differences. In that case, if the stuff ever gets together, it's gone. Now, how did the universe get started? Well, Goose suggests that there was no universe and that there was this quantum field somehow, which doesn't have matter and nothing. And then somewhere in that field, after eons of time, a little random wiggle happened. And if you look at a lot of Native American tradition, actually they talk about the wiggle at the beginning of time. The wiggle was something became different than another thing for some reason. 
So God uh, perhaps was the, the wacky process that made that happen when the universe, the pre-universe, was this beautiful light level field, everything's happy. And suddenly there was this wiggle, watch, wiggle. Now the wiggle was profound because it unfolded the universe from that point. Because, oh, you know, you're different than me now. Well, I'll make more different stuff than you and and I'm, oh, we're growing, oh my goodness. Suddenly there's this huge monstrous thing that's growing, it's starting and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> Now, we even another part of the story. Voice. Remember we, we talked about voice or survival. What does a baby do when it comes out of the womb? It screams, shouts, screams, hollers. That is how the baby announces, I'm here, you know, I exist. Well, it turns out we, we did a weird conference. We don't do anything but weird conferences. Uh, where we took 60 people to a place called the Burgess Shale which is way up in the Canadian Rockies, not far from where I was raised, which has a city block long quarry cut out of a hillside full of Cambrian creatures, fossilized Cambrian creatures. And it's about 600 million years old. It's, it's like a book, it's like a library. You, you can actually go to the shale and there, it's all layers of rock. You can pull a book out, any piece of shale, crack it open on the side, open it up, and it's, it's plastered with soft-bodied creatures. No bones in those days. And you can see, oh look, this creature ate another creature for lunch. It's a, it's a unique place in the world. For some reason, at the bottom of an escarpment, 600 million years ago, these creatures were falling off a big cliff underwater and they were collecting and it was no oxygen, they didn't rot, and they got compressed into this nice little book of, of beings. At the very time when nature was figuring out how to make bodies. So, Cell, single cell things have been around for a long time, perfected that model, and then suddenly bodies emerged. Now the bodies in the British shale have five eyes on stalks, 13 pairs of flaps. They're wacky. It's like nature said, cool, let's try all these combinations and see which ones work. And so it's this weird period of algorithmic explosion, like in software, like software viruses or something. You can actually see this. So we took all these people there because we thought, We'll take paleontologists and computer scientists and artists uh, like Stephen Rook, people who uh, you may, may, may know about. We took them up there to stand there and look at this thing and contemplate sort of beginnings. This is 600 million years ago. It's not that far back, but contemplate ourselves 600 million years ago. So I'm weaving this story in because if you stand at a place like that, and you look at a bunch of these squishy creatures and I can see an eye flattened out and then I can see whatever, ah, that's really cool. And then it suddenly hits you, these are my ancestors. But, wait a minute, so I said, where did I come from? Paleontologist said, you came from this. There was this little thing here that had this little cord on its back. He said, that's the thing we call pachaia and that's the birth of all vertebrates, the backbones. That's the backbone there and that's what you come from. I thought, that's interesting. And when I look out at your faces, what occurred to me, and you should, why you should think you're, you're special, not in sort of church lady, you're special, that I'm trying to give you the idea of how far back you go. You're not just sort of so-and-so's daughter and so-and-so's son and hanging around burning man. You are at the top of a lineage of beings that goes back four billion years. Each being had the fortitude industriousness and chance to survive to reproduce it against all odds. You are a miracle machine. You are a piling up of billions and trillions and trillions of miracles of chance that you exist. And those ancestors, back to the little wiggly worm and even back further, they're yours. They, they're in your body. They're, they're written into your body. They're personally yours. They belong to you. So, in a sense, if you think about that, that I in, inside of me is the gift given to me by the wiggling little thing that we could just right to get away from that little thing and found a mate and fell in love and etc. But all these things that happen, they, they gave that to you. Phenomenal thing when you think about this engine was made, was made to make this possible. And those things that emerged, you know, were, were extremely built on this pile of miraculous fortune. 
So why is life doing all this? Why is life making all this happen? Then the, the thought occurs that if the total picture of the universe is made out of nothing, if the universe is expanding now and it, it, one day it turns around and it starts to contract and come back together, guess what happens? When it gets together, it disappears. Maybe that random fluctuation will never happen again. Maybe it's a one-time deal. So what does the universe have to do? It has to create a means to stop its own destruction. Now what can it do? What are its tools? Well, the laws of physics don't help it much because they're kind of preset and, gee, uh, Mr. Gravity, can you help me? You know, not collapse? I'm sorry, that's my job. I'm going to collapse you, you know. And uh, the only thing that the universe has is consciousness to stop the ultimate disappearance of everything in this random difference field. Now, the only way the universe can stop its destruction is the entire universe became conscious. So consider this, picture this, now how, how can you even conceive this? We're little bits of consciousness here and there. There's consciousness at Burning Man, and there may not be consciousness elsewhere in the U.S., but, you know, there are little bits. You know, there's, the matter is, if you consider it unorganized or less organized as conscious matter, it's like maybe a tiny fraction of 1% of all matter in the universe and energy is organized in, into consciousness. Well, maybe it'll grow. Maybe the whole point of all this is to, and we're, we're an experiment in how, gee, can these primates grow more conscious matter or, and energy in, in ways we don't know? So the universe is saying, okay, you try, you try, you try, you try, and um, hopefully someone will have enough of this ready in time. So could picture 100 billion years from now, the universal cloud, there's no more galaxies. Everything is starting to collapse in. Entities that were civilizations eons ago have fought all their wars, they've stopped all the, the stuff, they've, they've basically come to the collective consciousness that the whole thing is ending. All their culture will be lost, everything's going to be lost, their gadgets, their museums, their memories, which are all preserved through time, because you can look back through a telescope and see the past, but all that will be lost too, because time's going to go too, so it's the ultimate in the gamut. So these conscious civilizations, in which are maybe more than 50% of all of the content of the universe, have to come to an agreement about saving the universe as it's collapsing in this great ball is, is coming in. They don't have much time. Uh, so they communicate. The only way that they can create the conscious universe is if they commit themselves to a new being that's born. They have to conceive collectively and throw everything they have into this new being called the, the conscious universe that will be like a little baby. But the baby will wake up and not know who made it. The risk they take is they're, they're throwing everything in. And this baby, this universe will suddenly wake up. Ah, I'm alive. Now it's the whole universe that's alive. Every bit. There isn't a single bit that's not alive. Now that baby is produced by effort. Not only the effort of surviving little worm-like things, all the brains, everything went into creating that baby. It's the ultimate creation. The baby will, will, will be one and will be in a wonderful state. It's everything, right? That's what every baby thinks that they are. I'm everything you know, in the beginning. But the baby has to come to the realization that it's doomed in time. So the baby has to learn. Now the, the baby's being compressed being compressed by gravity, this giant ball is being pulled in, pulled in, it can feel its body compressed, but it actually probably thinks, hey, that I'm, I'm being compressed and I feel good. I'm being brought in as a whole, but what's actually happening is death is coming. Death's coming really quickly. So the baby has to come to a higher and higher level of consciousness quickly, and what the baby has as its tool is time. Not time in the future, because that's very short, but time in the past. The baby can look out in the cosmos, and it is the eye, but all time back to the beginning of the universe is visible to it. All civilizations and cultures and stars and events are visible, so it can look out and, and see and know its entire past and put together the picture of, wait a minute, I was brought together, and in the last moments there was this intent to create me, but why? And work out the fact that it is disappearing. And the only solution, and this is sort of the conundrum, does the baby work out the laws of gravity and physics and say, you know, I'm being crunched in by this force that 
is neither hates me nor loves me. The embrace that I feel is just the embrace of, of the reality of my own collapse. If I spin my body, I can spin it fast enough and I can create a kind of oblong shape. Now, interestingly enough, when you look at a blastula, when there's a, there's a new being form, an embryo, it becomes an oblong shape. It becomes sort of like a spoon-shaped thing before it creates a new body. So it goes from a ball, which is perfect form, but it's not really very good to build a body, and it creates an oblong shape. So could this whole universe baby start to spin itself? It starts to spin itself, pieces will start to orbit each other. And in fact, it momentarily defeats gravity from collapsing to one ball. Now there are two balls orbiting each other. You got your eggs out of one basket, so this baby is doing this. And, but here's the conundrum. The baby's now going to split itself in two. It's no longer going to be one, one perfect being. It has to break up and create an other. It has to start the cycle again of having separation, leaving this perfect union of completeness. Will it do it? Will it say, I will, I will split myself, and now there's another, and the other has its own path. And those others are now collapsing. They have to spin their bodies. They have to create, they have to fight the force of gravity and create more orbits and more orbits and more orbits until the universe now is a community as it was before. But it's a community hell bent on its on its own survival. It has to form a structure. It's like a structure like this that can keep gravity from collapsing and and killing all of the parts. So that could be the ultimate in irony. That if we all as a species, when you want a group mind trip or something like that, all the species were trying. This is this has been put into us through time in, in the deep recesses of the universe. That D1. Come, your separate beings walking around the ply, you're kind of uncertain and make an eye contact, but you really want that group mind. You want to look into people's eyes and not feel uncomfortable and stuff. We want that. Why do we want that? Because it's programmed into the universe to want that for its survival. It's programmed even now. That message is coming from the time when it, it that message is reverberating back through time. Be one. Start being one because it's the only way we'll survive. So this is coming from your future. And everything driving our species and driving Burning Man has come together as one. It's hard to do, but they need us to do it. But the ultimate irony is we'll survive by being one, but it can only be for a moment. The ultimate achievement of the entire creation of the universe and all this stuff is to be one, to be that one baby for that one moment when it was a single being, and then it has to give it up. Now, what happens in the future rendition of the universe, which is now all consciousness, it's all community, it's all multiple beings, there's, there's an entity that isn't conscious, all the same things, disagreements between bits of the universe, but the universe managed to spin itself from this random quantum fluctuation, create all this explosion of stuff, and it's spun itself into consciousness and created this one thing which for one moment, and that moment is the, is the defining moment of oneness. It, it projected that back to the past, and it now lives projected back into, into the future, as the universe is now a community of consciousness. And the universe then will evolve into another cycle, a life cycle, like a chrysalis, like a like a, a worm going into a chrysalis and then coming out as a butterfly in another cycle. So the entire universe is now, we can't see there, we can't understand that. It's all consciousness. Where do you go? What, what comes? What's the universe of all consciousness? But I think for our species, if we see our desire not to be alone and love as the force, that love is the force that is coming from that incredible, urgent desire and demand for survival of what this thing is that is the universe and that's coming into us. And shooting in from all, all angles and it's trying to get its way in because it needs every bit that it can get for that survival. It's reaching back into your minds and pulling pulling on you and saying, please, you know, please help. Well, it's, it's the big project. <laughs> so anyway, that, that's kind of what got all, all put together. So I think that's about all I can say.
Is our vision, our love, and our will to be alive all simply a reflection of the brilliance from that great implosion into consciousness our universe is now looking back from? Please send us your impressions as words, art, and music to drbruce.org. Thanks go out to Ankar, Neon Monte, Chaos Lab, and Arturo for contributing music tracks most skillfully edited and rendered by Jake McDonald. This has been another Journey into the Levity Zone with Dr. Bruce. Any part of this or other Dr. Bruce podcasts may be freely downloaded and remixed and used in your projects. Find Bear Voice versions long and short at drbruce.org and please do remember to send us back your work so that we may feature it in the Levity Zone.